ever have a morning where like everything seems to go wrong? Um, hopefully it's not this morning for you. Uh, but you know, you know how to, you wake up late, you oversleep, and then you, um, uh, and it's not the Sunday where you get to fall back. Like you really oversleep. And so you're pressed for time, so you're yelling at the kids, and then you finally get them dropped off. And when you make it uh, to your office there, waiting for you in the office, are all of the pastors and ministers of Coleman, Alabama. Everyone, they've gathered together for an intervention. <laughs> And you sit down, you're like, what's going on? I've never been so nervous in my life. And they lean in, they say, this is not just one church, not just one denomination. Collectively, we all agree that you are demon-possessed. And you uh, are doing, you're only doing what you're doing because you're controlled by a demon. you imagine? Uh, (laughs) By the way, uh, if you look at the person next to you, you're like, well, that would explain a lot. (laughs) You've totally missed the point. you imagine the intensity and the adrenaline? Uh, That is exactly how one morning started out for Jesus of Nazareth. He starts out by hearing this blasphemous accusation in the Gospel of Mark. We're going to be in Mark chapter 4 today. This blasphemous accusation where the Pharisees say, the reason you're able to cast out all these demons and the reason you're able to set people free from addiction and from bondage and spiritual darkness is because, and this is blasphemy, you're only able to do it because of the power, you remember this? Because of the power of Beelzebub. See, it's, it's Satan, the demons working in you. That's how you're able to do it. And of course, you know, the, the, the people are able to sort of, you know, laugh that off as ridiculous, and the logic is there. A house divided against itself can't stand. If I'm casting out demons by demons, then, you know, is Satan attacking himself? So that's ridiculous, but nonetheless, very intense and emotional. And, and immediately after that, that's how his morning starts. Immediately after that, his mother and his brothers come to you. I should say half-brothers come to him, and they try to kidnap him. Do you remember this? They try to kidnap him and take him back to Nazareth because they say, yeah, he's out of his mind. So even your own mama and your brothers don't even believe. They, they, they think you're crazy. Well, he escapes. They don't, they're not able to kidnap him. The same day he escapes and he goes down by the lake and he teaches all day long and he teaches in parables. And Mark, we get this, you know, this teaching where he's got all these parables. He, the crowds were so great that he had no time to rest. He had no time to leave. Eventually, he gets in boats. He would do this, right? He would get in a boat and back out a little bit from the shore. And that way, he'd create a little makeshift stage. And the, the stillness of the water would carry his voice. And there's hills around him, a nice little natural amphitheater. And he could be heard. It's the only way with all those crowds. So now, if you're following the story, what started with being told you were demon-possessed by the religious leaders... And then your own mother and your half-brothers are trying to kidnap you because they think you're mentally insane. Then you spend all of the whole day long preaching your heart out and teaching. By the end of the day, he is exhausted. And he's hungry. And he's sunburned. (laughs) Am I the only one? Do you remember this summer? Do you remember that? Does anyone know the difference between tired and lake tired? Am I the only one who knows what I'm talking about? Like lake tired is just a thing. You're out in the sun and it just zaps you. And later that day you're like, wow. So here she is sunburned and lake tired, totally exhausted. He says quite naturally in verse 35, that's where we're going to pick up the action. <clears throat> Mark 4 verse 35. On that day, that's how we know it was all, this all happened in one day. When evening had come, he said to them, said to his disciples, let us go across to the other side. We got to get some rest. We got to we got to get across. And so verse 36 leaving the crowd, they took with him sorry, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. Now what's that business about just as he was? Because the hymn says, just as I am. That's what I was kidding. He says, just as he was, meaning, and other boats were with him, meaning they take him, they don't let him go home and get a shower. They don't let him uh, go home, get something to eat. I mean, just as he was, in the boat, exhausted, they don't go anywhere, they go. Where were the Southern Baptists to bring him a casserole or something? The guy's starving, he's exhausted. You can have kosher food that has Ritz crackers and butter. It's okay, right? Nobody, nothing. And the other boats were with him. He's getting them across to the other side. Now, spoiler alert. Here's where we have to do this. If you grew up in church, okay, if you grew up going to Sunday school and all this stuff makes sense, then you realize this is one of the most beloved stories in the whole Bible for Christians. They love it. This is the story of how Jesus calms the raging sea. If you did not grow up in church, spoiler alert, there's about to be a massive storm and Jesus is going to calm it. 
okay? So if you need, you need to know that, that that's what's about to happen. Of course, if you grew up in this, then you know it. You know all the songs. Come on, right? With Jesus in your boat, you can smile in the storms. Smile. Nope, nope, don't know that one, okay? Thought, thought that was a... So there's this massive thing. In fact, it is the, it is the first of four miracles. Mark, Mark shows them boom, 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 and the key theme overall is victory, authority, absolute sovereignty. Make no mistake, he has bound the strong man, Satan, and now he is plundering the strong man's goods. He is king of kings. And the miracles start with this one. He's going to calm the natural disaster. He's going to calm the raging sea. Then he's going to make his way on the other side, waiting for him on the other side of the sea is the land of the Gerasenes, the Gerasene demoniac. And he's going to heal that Gerasene demoniac and exercise the demons. Then, right after that, immediately he's going to see a woman with an issue of blood for 12 years. And while he's dealing with her, somebody else is going to come up and say, my daughter is sick to the point of death. He heals the woman with the issue of blood, makes it, they think, too late for the sick daughter and raises that girl from the dead. So if you're keeping score, that means he has absolute sovereignty over disaster, demons, disease, and death. There's nowhere outside of the realm of his sovereign control. And that's what Mark is trying to get across. Boom, boom, boom. This is the first of what they call the nature miracles, where it is revealed that Jesus is not just a healer and a teacher and a preacher. He is sovereign over nature. That's what's coming. Here's the point. I've got some things I want you to write down. Lessons in the storm. The first is this. Would you write this down? Jesus calls his disciples into a storm. Jot that down in your device or write it down. Jesus calls his disciples into a storm. Why do I make a big deal about this? Uh, Jesus was not surprised that a storm was going to pop up on the water. Uh, If you can control the weather, you can certainly predict the weather, right? Something no human can do. Don't let them fool you. We can't predict weather with perfect accuracy. Uh, uh, Christ can. He knew it was coming. What's my point? Why do I make a big deal about this? Jesus and the disciples were absolutely in the will of God, and a massive storm came up in their life. Why do I say that? You can be completely in the will of God and still have massive tragedy in your life. Everybody understand that? Let's get our theology straight here. You can be absolutely in the will of God, and you are not guaranteed a storm-free ride. Okay? Absolutely, problems are going to come, and you can can be perfectly obedient, and those problems come. It's very important. Why did Jesus want to, why did Jesus say, let us go to the other side of the lake? For one thing, he needed rest. He needed to get away from the crowds. Um, If you want to impress your friends, the the nature of Jesus, theologians call the nature of Jesus the hypostatic union. And what that theological term means is this. Jesus was, his, his substance was united. He was all God. And, at the same time, all man. He was 100% God and 100% man. So he was God. He would feed the 5,000 and do these miracles. He was man. He would get sunburned. He would get tired. And he needed rest. But more than rest, he knew he had a divine appointment on the other side of the lake. There waiting for him was a garrison demoniac who lived among the dead people, lived among the tombs. And the the, the local occupation of the people, they they were pig farmers. Now, can you imagine being a religious Jew? Could there be anything more pagan, more lost, more unclean than a demon-possessed guy who is ceremonially unclean because he's always around the dead people, and on top of that, their occupation is pig farmers, and yet Jesus is on a mission. He's come to seek and to save that which was lost. So he says we got to go to the other side. But the main reason he calls the disciples into the storm is he's going to teach them. This is next up on the syllabus of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. He's a teacher. He's the master teacher. They, in fact, call him rabbi. They call him teacher in this very story. He's not surprised by the storm that's coming. It's tonight's curriculum. Tonight's lesson. The storm. He's about to teach the disciples, and he's going to teach us. And sure enough, here it is. Without further ado, verse 37. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. It's a, a little hard to get across. We're going to see the word great three times in this story. You know, the, you know the Greek word for great. It's mega. So we have this mega storm. It's hard to appreciate. The, the, the boat already filling. Maybe you've been on Smith Lake and you've seen some storms come up. Okay, this isn't that. The Sea of Galilee is a, uh, at low elevation, but it's surrounded. It's an unusual place. Nowhere like it in the world. The Sea of Galilee, low elevation, but it's surrounded by high elevation, these mountains. I think Her- Mount Hermon is like 9,000 and change feet high. 
So the cold air from the mountaintops and the warm air coming off the lake, these, these squalls would, would come up. It's like a, a natural wind tunnel. And, the, and, the, and the, the sailors were used to that. Remember, before Jesus called them into ministry, some of them were fishermen. They knew this lake like the back of their hand. I say lake. This is the, the Sea of Galilee. This is a massive body of water. But this is enough to make even these experienced sailors scared to death. And the business about the boat was already filling means it's too late. They're in a sailboat, not a rowing boat. They can't, there's no move they can make. All they know, they're, they're going to die. And so you've got these, these sailors that are, that are panicked. These are experienced sailors. I mean, not all of them. Matthew was a tax collector. Of course, he's losing his mind. But the sailors, I've got a calculator. That's no help. You know? But the sailors are scared to death. And where's Jesus? We're all going to die. The waves are 10 feet high and they're crashing into the boat. The boat's rocking. Where's Jesus? Verse 38 continues. Jesus was in the stern asleep. Here's my favorite part. On the cushion. I love that. He's not just asleep. He has a pillow. Uh, I'm, um, some of you are light sleepers and some of you are sound sleepers. But like, how soundly do you have to sleep to have a boat that is taking on water and you're all about to drown? The thing's crashing. You know, I mean, some of you, you get up in the morning. What was that? What about that storm last night? Oh, oh, what storm, right? But this is different. It's one thing to sleep through a sermon. It's another entirely to be asleep on a pillow. Why do I love that? That is one of my favorite details in all four Gospels is that Mark adds, he had a pillow. Do you know why I love that so much? Why is that there? Seriously, why is that there? I mean, first of all, what would any of us give to be the disciple who sees Jesus trying to catch a few Z's and to realize we could make him a little more comfortable by lifting up his head and sliding that pillow under there? Who of us wouldn't want to do that for our Lord and Savior? But, but anyway, why is that detail there? It adds nothing to the story. It's never mentioned again. Why the cushion? In fact, I'll, I'll do you one better. Why, why a couple verses ago did, did it say, and other boats were with them. Did you notice that? Have you ever heard a sermon on the other boats? <laughs> yeah, we was a ways off. We were in those other boats that nobody remembers from Mark 4. Like, we have no idea. So it doesn't do anything in the narrative. It doesn't move the plot forward. You got these random other boats, utterly irrelevant. You got Jesus asleep, and he's on a pillow. Utterly irrelevant. Why are these irrelevant details in this story? I'll tell you why. Because that is exactly how eyewitness accounts work. That's why. These are, leg these are not legends. Legends are written. Things, everything advances the plot. We move it forward. These are not legends. These are eyewitness accounts. Peter is telling Mark, yeah, I saw Jesus. He was asleep on a cushion. And that stuff sticks. It's the details that stick out in your mind. Why? Because he's telling what happened. The, the, the Bible is, is not legend. It's eyewitness accounts. And so you get things like pillows and extra boats. Can't make this stuff up. Well, it's the only place in the New Testament where we see Jesus sleeping is in a storm. It's, it's not the only place, though, in the Bible where we see a, a, a man sent by God asleep on a boat during a storm. Do you remember? Bible trivia time. It's in the Old Testament. He was actually running the wrong way from God. He was on a mission of disobedience instead of obedience. Do you remember who it is? That's right. It's Jonah. Jonah the prophet sent to the Assyrians, those wicked Assyrians. Here's Jesus going to the Gerasenes. Jonah went to the Assyrians, and he's asleep in the storm. Anyway, fully human. Well, they woke him, it says, and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? I don't know what you'd have to do to wake Jesus. I mean, the, 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 vol the sheer volume and the intensity and the waves crashing in, the boats filling up, if all that doesn't wake Jesus, what would? But somehow they get his attention they yell, teacher. There must have been a lot of yelling. It must have been chaos. In Matthew's version, it says, Lord, do you not care we're all going to die? In Luke's version, it says, master, master, do you not care we're perishing? Now, here it says, teacher. Is that a discrepancy in the Gospels? One says, master, one says, Lord, one says, teacher. Is that a discrepancy? No. That's pandemonium is what that is. Everybody's yelling something else. There's probably countless voices, at least 12 of the disciples' voices, screaming at Jesus to wake up. And I love this. I love it so matter of fact. It's not, Jesus, help us. Jesus, grab a bucket. Jesus, do something for us. It's just, you know, just thought you might want to be awake. 
for your last moments on earth. <laughs> we were just curious if you even care that we're perishing. Not prevent us from perishing, Jesus. No, they don't ask him for anything. Why? Because we're the sailors. He's a carpenter. What is a sailor going to ask a carpenter from Nazareth about marine advice? Nazareth is a long way from the beach. And they don't ask Jesus for any help because they're, they're convinced there's nothing Jesus can do. This is a storm. This is a natural disaster. Those of you that go, love to go down to the beach, the next time a big hurricane hits, if you stand up in front of the hurricane and you try to calm that hurricane, we're going to have your funeral. Like it's not, it won't work, right? So they assume, Jesus, there's no power you have over this. We just, I don't know. We thought maybe, Jesus, you'd want to you'd wake up and say your, say your last prayer. I mean, do you even care, Jesus? We're all going to die? Do you, do, you hear, do you hear that? There's sort, of a, there's sort of a rebuke in that, isn't there? Don't you even care? That we're perishing? You hear the rebuke? Oh, how like the creature to rebuke his creator. You ever feel that way? Jesus, do you not, do you not care what's going on, Lord? Look around, Lord. You ever feel that way? Look around, Lord. Wake up, Lord. Do you not see that we're in a pandemic, Lord? Do you not know, Lord, there's an election on Tuesday? Wake up, Lord. Lord, are you not even on Twitter? Wake up. Do you not get the news feed? Do you not see what's going on? Do you ever feel that way? Or let's make it even more personal. God, where were you during that storm? And you and God know exactly the storm you're talking about. Very personal sometimes. Lord, where were you? Why did you sleep through that? I've got these issues. I've got these problems. In my storm, where were you? Church, he led his disciples into the storm. And he cares for his disciples during the storm. You've got to hear me clearly. Hear the word of God this morning. Do not doubt the steadfast love of Jesus, even if he appears to be sleeping in the storm. Let me say it again. Do not doubt that he cares for you in the midst of your storm. Don't let the fact that Jesus is not solving it the way you want it to be solved. Don't let the fact that Jesus isn't doing it the way you want it done or he isn't doing it at the right time that you think he should do it. Don't let these things make you doubt his steadfast love during the storm. He cares for his disciples and he cares for you. H.B. Charles has a, a great sermon on this and he says he can't prove it, but I love what he says. He says, I can't prove it, but you can't prove me wrong, so we're going to go with it. But I, he, he, he theorizes, and I agree with him, he theorizes that the problem is not divine indifference the problem is human competence here's what he means it could be that Jesus is asleep in the stern of the boat because he is waiting for the disciples to be brought to a point where they'll cry out to him for help he says it could be that Jesus looks like he's asleep during the storms of your life so that you will be brought to a point where you have called everybody else you know to call and you've tried to solve it in every way you know to solve it. And you've played every card you know to play. And you've cashed in every favor you can cash in. And you've done everything you need to do until you're brought to your knees and say, Father, I stretch out my hands to thee. And Jesus says, there you go. There you go. So you thought the story is, why is Jesus asleep in my storm? And it may be that it's he's waiting for you to wake up to your need. We look at Jesus and go, why are you asleep? Why are you taking so long to answer my problem? And Jesus is looking at us going, how long is it going to take for you to wake me up? To cry out to me. Don't doubt the steadfast love of God in the storm. And don't doubt the sovereign authority over the storm. Look at verse 39. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. Good translation of this is, Hush, lay down. And it's in the perfect tense, as if to say, hush, lay down, and stay that way. Isn't this, a, isn't this a great moment? Can you picture it? They finally waken Jesus up. The storms are everywhere. They're cussing, and they're yelling, and they're, they're sailors, you know. They're not using church words. And they're getting everything gathered. And they, you know, this is it. We're done for. Jesus, do you even care that we're perishing? Hey, newsflash, Jesus, we're all going to die. Just thought you might want to know. Do you even care? Wake him up. So 
But Jesus gets up, boats sloshing to and four, massive, there's loud, you can barely hear anything, you know, gets up, wipes the sleep out of his eye, grabs his pillow, <laughs> makes his way to the front of the boat, hush, be still, and immediately, look what it says, and the wind ceased, and there was great calm, this is the second time we've seen great mega calm, we had a mega storm, now it's mega call. What does that mean? It means simply this. A skeptic might say it could be a coincidence. It could be a coincidence for someone to yell at a storm, be still, and the winds die down. But how do you explain the waves? Hmm? That's not coincidence. That's miracle. You've been out on Smith Lake. You know that even after a storm, it takes hours, long time for those waves to stop sloshing and crashing all around. According to this, it says the wind and the sea obey him. In other words, the wind stops and the sea suddenly like glass. Like on those, on those mornings when you go out and nobody's been on the lake, just it looks like glass. Suddenly it goes like, do you understand? It goes from, it goes from mega storm to mega calm. Mega calm. There's silence and then there's awkward silence. There's the silence that you and I can share in a room together and then there's Zoom call silence, which is the awkwardest of all silences. Am I alone in the world? It, gets, it goes mega call. At the words of Jesus, all of nature submits like an obedient puppy. I want you to notice, too, how he did it. He didn't say, in the name of some other deity. He didn't say, in the name of God, I rebuke you. He didn't say, in, I come in the authority of God Almighty. He spoke straight to the wind and the waves. There was no incantation. There was no formula. There was no in the name of another authority. Why? Because all authority was in him. And the wind and the waves obeyed because they recognized the voice of their maker. So they snapped to attention. He didn't need any borrowed authority. He has it all. Well, it's a miracle. No other way to say it. That's a miracle. Can I ask you, can I ask you point blank? Do you believe this story? You don't have to answer out loud, but like, I mean, do you believe it happened? It's a miracle. 2,000 years ago, there was a man from Nazareth, and he could speak to the wind and the wave. And nature obeyed him. You believe that? I love this story because this isn't one you can sort of believe. <laughs> you can't halfway believe in this one. He either did that and that's a miracle or, or not. Um, if you don't believe, because if, if this didn't happen, if this didn't happen, then we got a problem. Because what else in God's word didn't happen? What else can we not believe? If, however, it happened, and of course if it happened, it doesn't really matter if we believe it or not. That's our problem, not, not the word's problem. But, but, but if it truly happened, then uh, what else in here? It happened. Resurrection happened. The cross happened. We can believe every word of it. Do you understand? My point is you don't get to pick and choose in the Bible the parts that you believe and the parts you can explain away. It's either true or it's not. Now, let's say for argument's sake that you believe it's true, that this really happened. Well then, isn't the application clear? If Jesus has authority over the raging sea with but a word, then let's talk about the authority he has over your life. If with a word he can calm a raging sea, then what, church, what in your life can he not fix? What can he not do? It, there is no, there is no problem he cannot solve, no marriage he cannot mend, nothing taken that he cannot restore, no sickness he cannot heal. There is no sin he cannot forgive with a word. All authority. Right? But the story doesn't end there. You say, well, you know, what about the storms in my life? He doesn't calm. Oh, make no mistake. He calms every storm. Sometimes he does it like Peter where he calms the storm. Sometimes he does it like Paul where he leaves him in the storm, but he, calls, he calms the sailor. See, with Peter, he got the glassy sea all around him. With Paul, he gave him the peace that passes all understanding. Either way, he says, peace, be still. He'll either calm the storm or he'll calm you in the storm. Either way, he does it. 
but the story doesn't end there. I can't tell you how many time, how many devotional thoughts, they're good and they apply, but they always end there. They're like, so there you go. The point of the story is Jesus can calm the storms in your life. And that's great. And that is great. That's, that's awesome. That's totally an a- applicable point, but that's not where the story ends. The story ends after the storm. Watch. Jesus led his disciples into the storm. He's sovereign. He knew. He cares for his disciples in the storm. But he's got a plan beyond the storm. Jesus confronts his disciples after the storm. Whatever you're going through, he led you to it. He'll lead you through it. But he wants to, that's not where the story ends. He's got something in mind for you beyond that storm. And he confronts them. He wants you to learn. He wants you to reflect. It actually ends with a confrontation with some questions. Jesus looks around, verse 40. And remember, you could hear a pin drop. This went from silent to mega silent. A great calm. And you could hear a pin drop. And he said to them, I love this. <laughs> Why are you so afraid? What do you think they wanted to say to Jesus in that moment? What would you have said to Jesus in that moment? Oh, I don't know, Jesus. Maybe the fear? I don't know. I mean, I'm not a psychoanalyst, but I would say it stems from the fact we were about to die, right? See, Jesus, yeah, okay, but but like, why were you so afraid? But, but, okay, Jesus, you were asleep during all this, so let me break it down for you, okay? There were 10-foot high waves, and they were crashing into our boat, and we have, even though we're professional sailors, we had never seen anything like this before, and so uh, we were pretty certain that we were going to die, and then when the winds kept howling, and there was no relenting, and we're in a sailboat, not a rowboat, it was obvious that we were going to die. Jesus says, oh, yeah, 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 I got all that, I got all that, but like, but like why were you so afraid? You're not hearing Jesus. <laughs> there were these 10 foot highways and they crashed on the boat and there was a violent downpour. And bo- yeah, 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 yeah. Cool, 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 cool. But like, why were you so afraid? Jesus, how many times am I going to have to describe my problem? I imagine Jesus wants to say, but how many times am I going to have to show you my presence? See, what happened was um, you forgot what I said in this story. Look at the text carefully for this. They say, oh yeah, yeah, I know what you said. You stood up and you said to the wind, peace be still, and it was still. No, before that. Those are not the first words in this story, and to me they're not the most important. And before that, what are you talking about? Jesus says, go to the very top of Mark 435. (laughs) He says, says, go back, think back in your minds. What did I say? In fact, let's just do that as an exercise. What are the first words he spoke in this story? I'll read them to you straight out of the word so that we don't get it twisted. <clears throat> On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. So that's my word, Jesus says. That, 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 that's my promise. I say, we're going across to the other side. Therefore, You can bet your bottom dollar that we are going to make it to the other side. Yeah, but Jesus, my problems. No, 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 no. No, your problems keep getting bigger and bigger, but none of that changes my promise. And my promise is we are going to make it to the other side. And that's it. That's the word. They say, yeah, Jesus, but those are just words. Anybody can say we're going to go to the other side. No, those aren't just words. Those are my words. And the same words that can calm the raging sea are the same words that stand behind the promise. We are going to get to the other side. That's the promise. I didn't say that the trip would be easy. I didn't say anything about whether we'd go to the other side through a storm, around the storm, over the storm. I didn't even say you might die on this trip. I'll resurrect resurrect you like Lazarus, and we are getting to the other side. I didn't say it would be an easy trip. I didn't say it would be a hard trip. It might be a long, hard road, but there's a good, good end, because that's my promise, and I spoke this water into existence, and I spoke every one of you into existence, and my promise is greater than your problem. If I can only get one thing across to you, here's what I think this text is saying to us today. The Promise. Do you, do you remember taking arithmetic class, math class, back in the day? You remember greater than, less than? The promise. Seriously, do you remember greater than, less than? Because I can't remember if that's right. Did I do it the right way? Josh, we good? Okay. The promise is greater. And notice, it is not underlined. Because the promise is not greater than, but sometimes equal to. 
the problem. It's greater than. There will ne- the promise is greater than the problem. And the promise was what? We're going to the other side. We're going to the other side. And that promise is greater than the problem. See, what happened for the disciples is the problem got so big and the problem kept getting bigger and bigger. Guys, I don't know what to do to make your problem smaller. I really don't. I know the world puts a lot of emphasis on that. You guys got to meditate. You got to do self-care. You got to keep the anxiety low. You got to do all those things. Make your problem smaller. I can't help it. The problems just get bigger and bigger. What I can tell you is no matter how big they get, the promise is greater than the problem. Some of you let your problems get bigger than the promise. You didn't even remember the first words of Jesus, which are, let us go to the other side of the lake. And y'all, if he says we're going to the other side, we're going to the other side. There's big problems. Oh, there's a pandemic. But if he said we're going to the other side of COVID-19, then bless God, we're going to get to the other side. His His promise is greater than our problem. I know there's an election. Oh, there's this big election Tuesday. He said, we're going to get to the other side. Then, bless God, we're going to get to the other side. Why? Because the promise is greater than the problem. I want you to say that to each other this week. Big things, little things, let's practice now. Let's practice this so that we get this in our minds and in our hearts. I'll do the first part. You do the last part. You ready? The promise is greater than... Good. Now you do the first part and I'll do the last part just to make sure we got it. You ready? One, two, three. It's greater than the problem. Very good. Very good. Very good. I want you to say it to each other this week. And you'll know when you need it. You'll know. You'll know when the time is right. Could be a big problem. Could be a little problem. But you'll be talking to a friend. Maybe you'll put this on social media. You'll help each other out. you encourage each other. And it could be a big problem. Oh, we just got this phone call. The doctor says it's no good. We don't know what to do. And you'll be able to look at them in all seriousness and say, Mark chapter 4, man, the promise is greater than a problem. Or you'll be with your friend and you're watching the election results come in over the next several years. <laughs> Whatever. And you can, and, and, and they're, just, oh, they're screaming at the TV and they have absolutely lost their mind. You need to pull them down from the couch, hand them a pillow, <laughs> and say, hey man, the promise is greater than the problem. It could be big things. It could be a little thing. I can't believe they left off the whipped cream for my latte. The promise, Karen, is bigger than the problem. Like, come on. But uh, when Jesus says we're getting to the other side, somebody please tell me. Really, I mean this. How, without God in your life, how, because you know where I'm going with this. There is a river one day we must all cross. There's no going over it. There's no going around it. There's no going under it. There is a great and final storm that we will all go through. Every one of us will close our eyes in death. And then, even then, listen to me. What was his promise to the disciples? Let us go to the other side of the lake. What is his promise to you? Matthew 28, go ye therefore into all the world and make disciples, baptizing, te- baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded, and lo, I am with you to the very end of the earth. You got problems, I'm giving you my presence. And so the problem, he is with you. The problem is, is never going to be greater than his promise. What about death? How does somebody without God contemplate how do they live every moment knowing that they have no hope they have no one to walk with them through that final journey over that great river that last enemy death and death is the enemy of the christian don't get it twisted it's going to be put under his feet one day and there'll be a place where death is no more well how when we close our eyes in death even then the biggest problem of all death No, 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 the promise is still greater than the problem. You say, where is that in Scripture? I take you to John 14, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you. And I go, Jesus said, I go, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, there you may be also. Even in death, the promise is greater than the problem. I just need to know if you believe that, you know. Uh, Again, you don't have to answer this out loud, but I need to know if you believe that. I 
I'm not asking, do you understand it? Usually as a communicator, right, you, understanding's the goal. But as a preacher, it's not just understanding, it's faith. There's a big difference. If you understand that, then you leave here and you go, oh yeah, his promise is greater than my problem. Yeah, I, I totally get that. I've got that in my head. And um, you're still filled with anxieties and insecurities and nothing has changed. If it travels, however, from your brain, cognitively you understand, to your heart, and you get in the realm of faith, that's going to change how you do uh, Tuesday morning and Thursday night. It's going to change how you, how you parent and how you live and how you, how you relax and how you walk in faith, right? Do you, do you understand it or do you believe it? Look at, look at what Jesus asked him. Look at what he asked him. Why are you so afraid? Have you, he doesn't ask, have you no, have you still no understanding? Because it's not about the mental cognizant recognition of facts. He doesn't ask, have you still no understanding? He says, have you still no faith? Understanding is something you have in the present based on the past, past experience, past education, that has given you understanding for today. Faith is something you have in the present based on the future. Faith is this op relentless optimism that God is up to something good, even in the midst of a storm. So do you believe this? Have you still no faith? Well, you've heard of the calm after the storm. Verse 41, let's bring this to a close, is the storm after the calm. <laughs> and they were filled with, here it is, the third and final time we see the mega. There was a mega storm, had a mega calm, and now they're mega scared. They were filled with a great fear and said to one another, because you know Jesus, he goes right back to the pillow. And they're looking around like, what just happened? Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Peter's like, that sea is so glassy calm, I feel like I could walk on it. Jesus is like, one day, dog. Who then is this? They were scared of the storm. Now they're scared of the one who quiets the storm. They've never seen authority like this. Who then is this? Now, there's the great thing about, of course, the gospel of Mark, is that question is the point of the whole gospel. And if you've been with us since the first series in the gospel of Mark, which really started in Isaiah, uh, then you're being rewarded right now because you know exactly who it is. In Mark 1.1, 1, 1, it says he's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. You get it right from the top. All these characters are slowly having to figure it out. And we'll see the, the light continue to dawn as we go through Mark. For today, the promise is greater than the problem. I've asked the musicians to come and uh, uh, help us to have a time of response and that's what I want you to do. I want you to reflect on this. Okay, the promise is greater than the problem. And so as Brandon comes and gets prepared, I just want to tie up one last loose end. Just, just one. Um, it, Mark's story has been using language that is like uncannily parallel and even identical at points to the language that he's used in another Old Testament uh, uh, story. In fact, if you have time this afternoon and you're so inclined, take Mark 4, these verses we've looked at, and lay them next to Jonah chapter 1. The story of Jonah and, the story, and this story are like, I, I don't think Mark was doing it on accident. They are incredibly parallel. There's a contrast. Jonah was obviously running from God. He was on a mission of disobedience. Jesus Christ was on a mission of obedience. But look at the stories. Both Jesus and Jonah were in a boat. Both boats were overtaken by a storm. The descriptions of the storms in both stories are almost identical. In both cases, Jesus and Jonah were fast asleep during the storm. In both stories, the sailors woke the sleeper up and said, we're going to die. And in both cases, there was a miraculous divine intervention and the sea was calmed and as if all that's not enough, in both stories, the sailors then became even more terrified than they were before the storm was calmed. Two almost identical stories. With one difference. In Jonah's story, he says to the sailors, in effect, I know how to calm the storm. There's only one way the storm's going to be calm. Do you remember this? Do you remember? What did they have to do? They said, pick me up and throw me overboard. He was saying in effect, if I perish, you will all live. So he willingly throw me overboard because I'm on, it's the judgment of God. It's the judgment of God, that's, that's, what this is. That's, that's what this is, that's all it is and I know it. So throw me overboard and if I perish, you will live. And the sea is calm that way. This doesn't happen in Mark's story. 
or does it? You wonder if maybe Mark is foreshadowing something here. Remember in Matthew's gospel, he even says Jonah. He points out Jonah specifically. He says, uh, one greater than Jonah is here in your midst. I'm the true and better Jonah. I think he meant this. Jesus is saying, it's not going to happen today, but one day, I'm going to be thrown overboard into the storm of all storms. I'm going to go to the cross to calm the ultimate storm. The only thing that can truly hurt a human being, I'm going to deal with that. I am going to destroy destruction. I am going to break brokenness. With my death, burial, and resurrection, I'm going to kill death. How can he do that? Jesus Christ can do that because when he was on the cross, he was throwing himself willingly, like Jonah, into the ultimate storm, the ultimate waves, the waves of sin and death. Jesus was thrown into the only storm that can actually sink someone, the wrath of God. And that storm wasn't calm until it swept Jesus away. We still left with this question, Lord, do you care? Oh, if you can see the man of sorrows hanging there on a cross for your salvation, if he perishes, you live eternally. If he is lost, you're forever found. If you see the man of sorrows hanging there on that cross, you'll never again ask, Lord, don't you care that we're perishing? You'll know he cares. And if he didn't abandon you in that ultimate storm on the cross, what makes you think he'll abandon you in your current storm? And one day, one day, Christ is returning to still all storms for all eternity. In fact, John, the revelator, in the last book of the Bible, in Revelation, he says there in the throne room of heaven, and it was like a sea was like glass, a glassy sea. Why? Well, because nothing rocks heaven's throne room because he's the king of kings, ultimate authority forever. And forever we will know this lesson we're learning today. The promise is greater than the problem. Let's pray. God, grant to us who are your children that we would know this truth in the depths of our heart, not just in our brain, not just with our understanding, but in our heart of hearts. We believe by faith. We would apprehend this truth that the promise is greater than the problem, that your presence, you you are here with us. And if you say we're going to get to the other side, then it may be a long, hard road, but there will be a good, good end. We trust you. And God, I pray for anybody who hears this message or who's right here in this room, if they are not yet a believer, that today is the day. God, I don't think it is the case, perhaps, they, they, they don't need more understanding. They need faith. God, they need faith. Grant them that faith today. Let them believe. Let them put their faith and trust wholeheartedly in you. Let today be the day of salvation. Let them ask you, for if they have unbelief, for even more, to be helped in their unbelief for more faith. God, let us guard against a dangerous heart of unbelief. Let us believe that the promise is always greater than the problem. And grant to us that we might encourage others with this same word this week. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like you at this time to stand to your feet, if you would. We want to have a time of invitation. Brandon will lead us just in a verse or two of a song, but the idea is to give you a chance to reflect. Okay, the promise is greater than the problem. And try as best you can to get that from your head to your heart. And ask the Lord, drive that deep into your heart during this time. Creation knows the voice that's spoken to the void.
Amen. Amen. That's, I was singing that song too. It's was, it was awesome. Um, help me, church, remember, make, make sure we got it. The promise, say it now, the promise is greater than the problem. All right, all right. Encourage somebody this week. Hey, I want you to be seated because we've got these cool presentations to make. Uh, some of you, uh, uh, we're here. Uh, let me think. Um, so, yeah, okay, so we had a baptism at the 930 service. Praise the Lord. That was awesome. And at that service, uh, Kaylee Hooper is who we baptized. Uh, while she was still dripping wet from the baptism, we voted her in as a new member along with her uh, mom. Christy Hooper is uniting with our church in membership. So, uh, that was the great privilege of the 930 service, and we'll do it again in this service and then next week at 8 a.m. If you uh, are unfamiliar with uh, Baptist uh, traditions, in our church, uh, existing members vote in the new members. And so we'll do that now. If you uh, rejoice with me in welcoming Christy and Kaylee Hooper into the full fellowship and membership of Coleman First Baptist Church. Members, we've got work to do. Signify your vote by raising your hand and saying, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, an overwhelming majority there. We celebrate that. You just saw Amelia Phillips' baptism, and now she's joining the church, obviously by baptism. That's the one you saw moments ago, and so we rejoice and congratulate Amelia and her dear family. And so if you rejoice with me in welcoming Amelia, then signify your vote by raising your hand saying, praise the Lord. And we're not done yet. Uh, Bree Turner who was baptized uh, by First Baptist. Uh, we need to make official, make her a church member. She uh, works in our children's ministry. Many of you know Bree, and so we just need to officially present her for uh, uh, a church membership. She was baptized years ago, and I, 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 she said, I'm embarrassed. I, I don't think I ever, like, joined. And I said, oh, don't be embarrassed. You may recall, uh, when I became the pastor here, I was so excited my first Sunday that uh, our family didn't join the church. We, like, forgot. So we joined, I think, the next Sunday or maybe two Sundays, but I was like, what does that say? Like, I'm so happy to be your pastor. I would never join this church. Like, so like, <laughs> I said, don't feel bad at all. So um, uh, it's more of a formality. But nonetheless, if you rejoice with me in officially uh, welcoming uh, Bree Turner into the full fellowship and membership of Coleman First Baptist, signify your vote by raising your hand saying, praise the Lord. We praise the Lord there and much to rejoice. Hey, before the benediction, we want uh, to celebrate. I, I hope we always have these problems. We were talking about this. We, we've got a baptism to show you from last Sunday. And everybody's like, well, we got the, the two baptisms today. And we're showing a baptism video. It's going to be too much. And I was like, may we always be blessed with these problems. Amen. God is doing his thing. I think the internet's out today. We've got an outage and there's a pandemic and an election and the Holy Spirit doesn't, you know, he's still moving and working. So celebrate with me on this uh, uh, baptism then we'll have our benediction. Join me in welcoming Kensington Daniel, who's our baptismal candidate for today. Perfect. Kensington, you know, for... Thousands of years, uh, Christians have made this profession that we talked about earlier, that Jesus is Lord. And I'm going to ask Kensington to get to make that declaration. So on the count of three, we'll say Jesus is Lord together. But I don't want her to do it alone. All of us who are blood-bought, born-again believers in Jesus Christ, we all profess Jesus is Lord. So you, if you're a Christian in here, I want you to say it. And say it loud that Jesus is Lord. Say it with our young sister in Christ. Can we do it? Count of three. Ready? Jesus is Lord. Count of three. You ready? Here we go. You ready, church? One, two, three. Jesus is Lord. Awesome. Now, I'm going to ask you these questions. Uh, Kensington, have you come to a place in your life where you repented of your sins and placed your faith and trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And do you believe that Jesus is God's only begotten Son? He died on the cross for you and on the third day rose from the dead? And is it your desire today to tell the world that you are forever for King Jesus? Yes. Amen. Back up here. Step off. Now, based upon your profession of faith, and because of our Lord's command to baptize, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You ready? Therefore, we are buried in the likeness of Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. Congratulations. Amen. Amen. 
Never gets old. Stand to your feet. The promise is greater than the problem. Here's how Paul said that same sentiment. He said in Philippians, My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I love you. Have a great week. Thank you.